Exodus chapter 15, I want to read this verse to you. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 2 says this. It says, the Lord is my strength. It says, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and it says, I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. I want us to just pray for this morning's word. Lord, just speak to us. Speak to every single heart. Speak to every single mind, Lord, listening today, God. And Father, I pray that every ear would be open to receive your word. Holy Spirit, minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in the Bible, I want us to just uh, just talk about this for a second. In the Bible, there's this notable theme of battles and of conquering. And so there was the Israelites, they had to go into battle. They were in the promised land, but there was conquering and battles that they had to face. And so one of the details about many of their fights with their enemies was it always included God showing up as their salvation and as their strength and as their song. And so there was an empowerment of God. There was God working in them through their song that declared him as salvation. And so when they lifted up their voices to sing, what began to happen was it began to unleash the saving power of their God to all situations. And so this is such an important thing for us to know. Right now, we just finished a time of worship. We just finished a time of declaring God's goodness, of God's faithfulness. And I believe that in that time of worship where you have said no to your circumstance, but you've said yes to trust God in that moment, there's a spirit of God that is released over your life, over your family that, that recalibrates you. It, it brings you back to a place of trust in knowing God as your, as your salvation and as your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 21 says this. It says, he is your praise. It says, he is your God. And it says, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders that you saw with your own eyes. I love that, how it's talking about that he's the reason that we worship. He is our praise. He is our song. He is our God. He is the one that has done all these things for us, church. He is the one that has carried you from yesterday to today. He is the one that has carried you for years uh, to bring you to the place where you're at now. And you have every single reason to worship him today. I'll start by saying this. I believe it's God's strength that sustains us. Amen. I believe that it is God, the very hand of God, that is holding every single person that has called upon his name. I believe it's the very hand of God that is sustaining us in these moments and in this season that we're living in. I also believe it's the strong arm of the Lord who has held you up in times of trouble. And it is the very grip of God that holds us near to him in times like these. I love this verse in Psalm 89. In verse 8, it says this. It says, so awesome are you, O Yahweh, Lord God of the angel armies. It says, where could we find anyone as glorious as you? Your faithfulness shines all around you. And it says, you rule over oceans and the swelling seas. It says, when their stormy waves rise, you speak and they lie still. It says, you crush the strongholds of Egypt and all of your enemies were scattered at the mighty display of your glory power. How many of you know that it is through the glory and it's through the very power of God that the enemy must flee? Amen. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 16 says this. It says, he then reached down from heaven all the way from the sky to the sea. And he reached down into my darkness to rescue me. It says, he took me out of my calamity and chaos and he drew me to himself, taking me from the depths of my despair. And it says, and even though I was helpless in the hands of my hateful, strong enemy, it says, you were good to deliver me. When I was at my weakest and when my enemies attacked, it says, the Lord held on to me. It says, his love broke open the way and he brought me into this beautiful, broad place. He rescued me because his delight is in me. He is such a wonderful God, friends. The Lord is so powerful and he's so awesome because he's not far away. 
even though we go through circumstances that sometimes may make us think that God is distant, the fact is, is that the Lord is actually near. It says that he rescued us because his delight is in us. You see, if you know the Lord in strength, that means that if you know the Lord where he has delivered you and he has saved you, he has helped you, he's brought you out of some kind of circumstance and you know his power, then I believe that you almost that you must also receive the revelation that God delights in you. You see, God isn't just interested in helping you or saving you, but the fact is, is that he delights in you. He doesn't just save or sustain or protect or fulfill promises for those that he doesn't delight in. Think about this just for a second. Just the way a father or, or a mother delights in the accomplishments of their children so the heavenly father delights in you. So he is interested in what you've got going on. So he is interested in making sure that you are taken care of. That you're blessed. That you have everything that you need. In fact, I believe that God delights in all of his creation. And not just those who have said yes to him. God loves the entire world. Amen. I believe that. It's not just for those that say that they love him or those that go to church, but his unconditional love was for all of mankind. The strength-saving power, think about this. The strength-saving power of God is available for all who would place their trust in him. I believe that Jesus uh, came down from heaven and, and the Father sent him to be that example of love. Sometimes we live in a world where it seems like there is no love. And I would challenge you, the Bible says that those uh, who know God should love as God loves. And there is something that, that, is, that the world is also waiting for. John chapter 13 and verse 35, I didn't put it in the notes today, but John 13 and 35 says this. It says, the world will know that we are his disciples when we love one another. You see, love is that very element that God has given us. That conquers all things. It is the very power of God through unconditional and sacrificial love. That I believe he wants you to receive and to uh, just be revealed in your life today. And so I believe the Lord is our strength. Amen. God is our strength. He is our help. He is our deliverer in times like these. But he is also our song. He is also the one that we sing of. And there's something that's so powerful, the battle cry of the people of God. That is, the battle cry of the people of God has always been through song. It wasn't through weaponry or it wasn't through, you know, protection. It wasn't through those kinds of things. The battle cry of the people of God was always through song. That means that something happens when there is a declaration of the goodness of God from our lips. There is something that happens when all of a sudden we are excited and we worship God and we begin to thank God in circumstance that rises us up above the enemy that is waging war against us. There's this protection realm that just comes around uh, mine and your life when you worship the Lord. Because you're saying that you trust him more. You trust him more than than the bills that might be piling up, or you trust in him more than, than the food that might be lacking. You trust him more. You trust him more than the thing that the enemy is trying to bring against your body to just bring you down, or the thoughts that the enemy is trying to put in your mind. You are trusting God more. And when you worship church, it's just like this. If you could picture this with me. You're standing in the middle of a battle. You're right in the middle of a war zone. There's, there's just war and there's chaos and there's just, you know, there's just frantic people all around you. And your enemy is beginning to charge at you. He's beginning to pursue you. Your opponent is advancing towards you. But in that moment, in that moment, you don't shrink back. In that moment, you don't fall away. In that moment, you do not retreat. But instead of retreating, you begin to worship God. You begin to praise God. You begin to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
you begin to praise and bring praise to the one who has already won your battle. That is, you begin to sing aloud to the one who goes before you to destroy your enemies because your confidence is not in your ability to stand in a war zone. Your confidence is in his ability to win the war. That's where you find your confidence. That's where David found his confidence. It wasn't in David's ability to, to wield a weapon. It wasn't in his ability to, to do anything in his own power or in his own strength. But his confidence, he knew that in those moments in the wilderness, when he was taking care of his father's sheep, when he was doing what he needed to do to, to provide for his family and all of those things. The Bible says that when a lion or a bear came to attack those sheep, David was strengthened in the power of God, and he was able to overcome any single obstacle that the devil brought against him. And I'm here to remind you this morning, church, that your confidence in worship is not in your ability just to sing a song. See, you can sing a song in the middle of a war zone, but I believe it should be your confidence in God's ability to win that war that, that brings up a praise from within you that brings up a sound from within you that gives him the honor and gives him the glory before you even see the battle won. Amen? That is true trust. That is, a, that is a faith and a belief in God. I love this quote. It says this. It says, Worship is an act of war against the enemy of our hearts. It is a very act of war against the enemy of our hearts. On the exterior, it might look really foolish, it might look really foolish to worship God in the midst of a battle. But this battle that we're facing, church, this battle that you're going through in this world today, this is not a matter of flesh and blood as we know it. Not just because coronavirus attacks flesh and blood, but really what's happening here is this is a spiritual attack that has been unleashed on the earth. It's, it's a spiritual attack that has been unleashed in the, in the populace of this world. And so on the exterior, it might look really foolish to worship God in the midst of a battle. But on the inside, you're winning the war against the enemy who is trying to steal your attention and your affection towards God. That's exactly what is happening. The enemy is trying to discourage you in this moment. He's trying to bring you down because he's wanting you to think that this is not going to end or that this is not going to be over, or that somehow you're not going to make it through. But I want to encourage you today. Psalms chapter 18. Psalms 18 and verse 34 says this. You have trained me with the weapons of warfare worship. And he says, and now I will descend into battle with power to chase and to conquer my foes, to conquer my enemy. It says, you empower me for victory with your wraparound presence and your power within me makes me strong to subdue. And by stooping down in gentleness, you have strengthened me and you have made me great. You see, church, there is strength in your song. Amen. I said there is strength in your song that when you turn from worry about circumstance to worshiping in circumstance, God will change what once looked like a battle into a powerful blessing. Because this is what only God can do. True faith, church, is trusting in a God who appears unseen, but who reveals uh, his strength in our surroundings as we declare him in song. I believe that is true faith. We can't see God, but we can see his workings. We might not be able to see God, you know, in uh, standing in our living room today or standing in our home today, but we can see the presence of God working in us and working around us. I love what that verse says uh, that we just read. It says this, you've trained me with the weapons of warfare worship. He says, now I'll descend into battle with power to chase and conquer my foes. I love this. It says, that it basically what it is saying is your strength in a season like this is found when you embrace your ability for humility. That is when you have lowered yourself, when you have said, God, I am not capable of standing against this circumstance. 
God, in my flesh, I am not enough, Lord, to stand, Lord, against whatever the enemy is trying to do in my life, in my home, amongst my family. But God, with you inside of me, and when I take that position of humility, Lord, when I embrace the fact that, Lord, I might not be able to do anything about the circumstance, but you can and you will. When I bow my knees, Lord, to worship you, I am descending into battle. And it's my very act of worship. It's our humility, church, that invites his presence into our circumstance. I said it's, it's us saying, Lord, we need you. It's us saying, God, we, we humble ourselves before you. And when we have done that, the presence of God begins to just fill our home, begins to fill our life, begins to just fill our family's life, and just begins to sustain us in that moment. It's our willingness to surrender, church. It's our willingness to worship God so that our enemies surrender and submit to us. You could be going through something right now, and I want to encourage you today. Listen, it, 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 some, there, there's some things that you pray about. There's some things that the, the Word of God speaks to you about. And there's some things that you just need to worship through. Amen? You need to just lift up that weapon of warfare, which is praise. And you need to begin to just worship Him and begin to make the devil's ears sting. Because when you lift up the mighty name of Jesus, when you exalt Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the devil must flee. I said the enemy must flee. When you surrender to worship God right there, your enemy must submit to you. When you speak the name and you speak out God's praises, you are choosing praise over problems. You are choosing worship over worry. You are choosing songs over shame. You're releasing the very atmosphere of heaven to destroy all of hell in your life today. This is the power of worship. This is the power of praise. Psalms chapter 9 verse 1 says this, Lord, I will worship you with extended hands as my whole heart explodes with praise. He says, I will tell everyone everywhere about your wonderful works and about how marvelous miracles exceed expectations. He says, I will jump for joy and I will shout in triumph as I sing your song and make music for the Most High God. He says, for when you appear, I will worship while all my enemies run in retreat. He says, and they will stumble and they will perish before the presence of the almighty God. This is what worship unlocks for you, church. This is the power of praise. It says, for when you appear, God, you worship him, church, and all of a sudden he appears. All of a sudden he makes his presence known. All of a sudden, he begins to fill that room. All of a sudden, he begins to fill that heart. And it says, your enemy, they stumble and they perish before the presence of the Almighty God. This is the power of worship. This is the power of a living God. Some of you might be being attacked today at this moment. You might be going through something in your body. You might be going through something in your home. Husband against spouse or, or children against a parents or just family issues or, or issues with your finances, whatever the case may be. All you need to do, church, listen to me carefully. All you need to do to reverse that curse is stop complaining and start confessing. Start worshiping God. When you do this, the worship that you offer to God will demolish every single stronghold in your life. It will demolish every single thing that the enemy is trying to bring against you. And so this verse illustrates it so beautifully. Just picture this. Picture your hands raised and God just stepping into your battle zone. Hands raised is a sign of surrender, church. It's a sign of saying, God, I, I, have, I have nothing but this to give. I, I raise my hands to you, Lord. I surrender myself. And in that moment of surrender the Lord begins to step into the battle zone. I remember when I was a kid, I remember when I was uh, a little boy, you know, sometimes we'd, we'd get our dad's flashlight or something and we'd, 
we'd, we'd stick it against our face and, you know, we'd hide in a dark room and tell scary stories or do whatever, you know, and you'd, you'd put that flashlight on your face and all of a sudden as it lit up your face, it would cast a huge shadow behind you. It would cast this big shadow and, you know, you'd, you'd play around like that and that shadow would, would be something that was, that was bigger than you were. And the picture in the kingdom is very similar, except it's the light of Christ that shines on you. It's the very spirit of the living God that lives inside of our hearts that is beginning to just illuminate uh, uh, our atmosphere, illuminate that area where we abide. But the beauty of what happens when that shadow is, uh, uh, when that light rather is, is bursting inside of us, all of a sudden there's a shadow that is cast around you. And I believe that when Christ is living into your hearts, there's this shadow around you. And that is the very presence of God overshadowing your life. And that presence is so great. It's so powerful that even in the midst of a trying situation, it forces the enemy to leave. The enemy must back off in retreat. And so I believe that somebody listening today, you might be under intense attack. And you have no idea why. You have no idea why the circumstances is the way that it is. And somebody might be anxious and you might be restless. You might be hurting. Your, your mind might not be able to, to slow down. And, and all of a sudden you're just, you're feeling all this, this pressure around you. You've been worried as to how you're going to provide for your, for your family or for your, for your children or for yourself. Or you've been afraid of how you're going to survive in this season. I'm here to remind you of this. Psalms 91 and verse 9 says this. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, it says no harm will overtake you, and no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. When you have put yourself and when you have said, God, I place my life, I place my heart, I place my mind, Lord, I place my family, God, into your care, into your trust, God. I make you my dwelling place. I stay there. I stay in you. It says no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you. Not just anybody, you. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. Psalm 91 and verse 1 says this, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress and my God in whom I trust. Where you dwell today, where your heart has placed its trust will reveal if you have rest or if you have restlessness. If you have peace or you have chaos and anxiety. It's where you have chosen to put your trust. If you have put your trust in an almighty God, then in the shadow of the almighty, peace and rest must abide. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 says this, it says, Come to me, all of you who are weary, that is worn down and burdened, and he says, and I will give you rest. You see, Jesus is speaking right here, and he's speaking to you and I. He's saying, listen, he says, come to me. Don't, don't wander around any longer. Come to me. Listen to the voice of my spirit that is, that is speaking out to you today, and answer that call. Answer that opportunity to to place your life in his hands. Because you are weary. You are worn down. You are stressed. You are burdened. You are, you are full of this anxiety. And listen, the Lord is declaring over you today that if you run to him, he will give you the rest for your soul that you need. Jesus is all you need. I said Jesus is all that we need. You will find rest in him. You will find strength in him. You will find peace in Him. You will find hope in Him. You will find unconditional love in Him. You will find victory in Him. 
You will see your enemies defeated through him. You will witness miracles because of him. And you will become righteousness by him. Because we are living in a time, church, when all we need is all he is. I said when all that you need is all that Jesus is. He is everything that you need today. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says this. He is the divine portrait. That is the divine image. The true likeness of the invisible God. And the firstborn heir of all creation. For in him was created the universe of things. Both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and all that is unseen. Every seat of power, every realm of government, every principality and authority, it all exists through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in the resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all of his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of, the, of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. It's just made holy through Christ. It says, even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. He released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as the sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. And now there is nothing between you and, and Father God. He sees you as holy, flawless, and restored if indeed you continue to advance in faith. Assured of, firm, of a firm foundation to grow upon. It says never be shaken from the hope of the gospel that you have believed in. You see, church, you don't have to wait for answers and cures and vaccines and stimulus checks because they're not going to give you eternal peace. Having wealth or popularity or fame isn't going to gain for you the comfort of having a relationship with Christ. I'll read that verse one more time. Exodus 15 and 2 says, The Lord is my strength. And my song. And he has become my salvation. You see, if you know God in strength, then you should know God in worship. And ultimately, he will become your salvation. Jesus is salvation. The Bible says that there is no other name given in heaven and on earth by which we can be saved. It's not through other religions. It's not through foreign gods. It's not through buying your way into an eternal paradise or, or heaven. But it's only through the name of Jesus. Jesus embodies all that we need in all of him. The Bible teaches us that he was born of a virgin birth. That Jesus was later grown up and he, he, he rose as a man and he showed as a man what a perfect relationship with the Father in heaven, what it looked like. He exemplified everything in his life. He trusted his Father in heaven. He trusted and he listened to his voice. He spoke what his Father told him to say, and he went where his Father told him to go. In his life, he released the power of a connected life to God wherever he went. That is all the authority that heaven possessed. Because in heaven there's no sickness. In heaven there's no demons. In heaven there's no worry. In heaven there's no lack. Jesus released all these things into the earth wherever he went. And he showed that if you were connected in your heart to Jesus, then you could be connected to the Father in heaven. You wouldn't have to experience lack. You wouldn't have to experience sickness and disease. But you could find healing, you could find peace, and you could find rest in this name of Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus went about and he, he performed countless miracles. He did things and there were signs and there were wonders that, 
that he showed and that he released into the earth. And the reason that he showed the world the authority in which he carried was always to reveal the Father's heart for you and I. So by Jesus healing and by Jesus, you know, professing life over people, by Jesus doing every single thing that he did, he was doing it all, church. He was doing everything to reveal the Father's heart for you and I. It was to reveal the goodness of this God to you and I. To know that you had somewhere to place your trust. To know that even if you were orphaned as a child, to know that he would never leave you and he would never forsake you. He would be a perfect father for you. To know that if you were lived in poverty, to know that the very riches of heaven could be yours if you would just place your trust in him. Jesus showed us what unconditional love looked like when he said this, for your sins I will die. The Bible says that there is no greater love. There's greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. I believe that the passion and the compassion of the heart of God is because he formed you. He longs for you. He loves you. He cares for you. Jesus showed us what compassion looked like when he said, I long to gather you to myself like a hen gathers her chicks. Jesus showed us what mercy looked like when he stopped those religious leaders from, from throwing those stones at that prostitute woman. And when he said, the person who is without sin, throw the first stone and no one was able to because the Bible says that all of us fall short of the glory of God for all of us have sinned. The wages of this sin this, this thing, these evil thoughts, the wages, that is the payment that we deserve is death. It is death. But Jesus showed us what healing looked like when he touched those who had leprosy and their skin became clean. You see, nobody would dare to touch these people that had this depraved sickness and condition and disease. In fact, they were told to, to stand on the outskirts of the cities and declare that they were unclean. It was this shameful act. It was this shameful thing because they, they had a disease that they didn't ask for. And right now, people are walking through supermarkets and in stores today, and they're walking around, and people are afraid, and they're looking at each other as if everybody's unclean, as if everybody has this virus. But I can tell you right now, coronavirus wouldn't stop Jesus and wouldn't stop the power of his love from reaching out to you and from touching you and from healing your life. If leprosy couldn't stop him, then coronavirus won't stop him either. And I'm here to declare to you this morning that Jesus is everything that you need today. That the Lord is everything that you and I need to place our trust in. Jesus showed us what provision looked like when he said this. He said, consider the birds of the air. Consider them that they don't have to plant. They don't have to harvest. They don't have to work for anything. And yet the Father feeds them. The Father in heaven provides for them. And he says this. He says, how much more valuable are you? How much more valuable are you? My friend, I don't know what you're going through today. And I don't know where your heart is, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is everything that you need. I said, Jesus is everything that you need. If some of you need God as your strength right now, then all you've got to do is just call out to him. Right there where you're at, if you say, Pastor Duke, I need strength in my life right now, just call out to the Lord. Some of you need God's presence in your, in your room right now to just fill your heart with peace. That I want you to worship him right there where you're at in song. Just begin to lift up the name of Jesus. You don't have to know how to play an instrument. You don't have to sing in tune. All you've got to do is sing out the name of Jesus. And he will begin to fill your heart and fill that room. And just begin to fill that space with the presence of the almighty God. Some of you right now need the salvation of Jesus. Then listen. Just call out to Christ. Just say, Jesus, I need you. 
Jesus, I need you. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2 says this. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. He says, the Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. He says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord. And call on his name and make known amongst the nations what he has done. And you will proclaim that his name is exalted. You will sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all of the world. He says, shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For God is great and he is the Holy One of Israel amongst you. We serve a great God. I said, we serve a great God, hallelujah. And he is worthy right now. But listen, right there where you're at, I want to pray with you. Before we go any further, I want to pray with you because I don't know where you're at today and I don't know what you need today, but the Holy Spirit does. And so if you would, if you would just bow your heads right there in your home, right there where you're listening from. I want to pray over you because I believe that the moment that we just begin to communicate with this God in heaven, The Lord will begin to just change your life. He'll begin to move and shift your season. He'll begin to move and shift those things that the enemy has tried to bring against you today, right now. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we call upon you. We call upon you as our source of strength. God, we are not capable within ourselves, God, to do or manipulate anything, God, about heaven, Lord. But, God, it's your strength filling our life, Lord, that, Lord, just pushes back the enemy. It's your strength filling our life today, God, that sustains us. The Lord, that lifts us up, God, when we're weak, Lord, and that helps us, God, when we are just frail, God, and we feel like we can't go on. And so, God, we call upon you today, and we ask that you would strengthen your people, Lord. I pray, Father, peace and strength into their life right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we, we, Lord, call upon you also, God, to, to just worship you right now, Lord. I believe through this praise, God. I believe through saying the name of Jesus. I believe through placing you, God, at that altar of praise, God, and lifting you up above this war zone, God, lifting you up above the battle, lifting you up, God, above everything that we are facing right now, Jesus. Lord, you will begin to push back the enemy. You will begin, God, to just expel every single evil work that he is trying to bring against us or bring against our family or bring against our church, Lord. And so right there in the name of Jesus, God, we honor you today. We lift you up, Holy Spirit. We lift you up, Jesus. We honor you, Father in heaven. And God, we know, Lord, right now, God, you are pushing back the enemy, Lord. You are pushing him out of the picture. He is retreating right now because we call upon the name of Jesus in which darkness and hell must tremble to, in which darkness and hell must flee from. Only the name of Jesus. We bless you right now, Lord. We honor you right now, Jesus. We thank you right now for your goodness today. We thank you, Lord. And we pray right now, Lord, for somebody. Maybe there is somebody right now that doesn't know you. God, I just make this appeal to them right now. They have been listening. They've heard about this God as as strength. They've heard about this God as song. But Lord, they need to know this God as salvation. And so in Jesus' name, right there where you're at, you might feel this tug, this, this warmth of the Holy Spirit just calling your name. Listen, I want you to know the Bible says that even before you were formed in your mother's womb, God's known you. And that God has a perfect plan for your life. So right there where you're at, I want you to just pray with me for forgiveness of sin, for for mercy and the grace of God to come into your life. And so if you would bow your head and simply say, Jesus, just repeat after me, say, Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you into my life. I thank you you died for my sins and from this day on 
I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior in Jesus' name. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead and I am now saved. I am now born again. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, I am trusting and I am believing that the very presence of the Spirit and the power of God has come over your life today. And you have now received this Jesus, this one that I've been speaking about this morning. You've received him as salvation in your life today. Listen, if you've received the Lord into your heart today, I want to just uh, encourage you. Listen, you can send us an email. Let us know right there where you're at. You can send us a message through Facebook or through Instagram, YouTube, wherever you're watching. Just let me know that you prayed that prayer. We just want to thank God for you. Right now, the Bible says that heaven rejoices over you.